How would you deal with the, the topic of prognosis in the current era, uh, Ajay? How would you discuss that with this patient? I always remember uh, I had a medical school class many years ago, which w the title of this elective was, is it cancer and can I still have sex? The two questions that patients <laughs> had, but were afraid to ask. And I think the point of that class was, 50% of what we tell patients, especially in the first visit, goes in one ear and out the other. And especially when you get to prognostication, it's very important to um, use the right terms and frame the question. And so, uh, first of all, prognosis always applies to large populations, not an individual. So we can say that on average, this is what might happen for a high-risk patient, standard risk, but there's no guarantee. And to that point, um, whatever we prognosticate, uh, I always tell patients what's more than what, important than what we prognosticate at your first visit is what actually hap happens. And that's functional risk, right? So if you're predicted to be high risk and your remission is lasting a long time, you're not as high risk as we thought you were. And conversely, if you were a low risk patient and you relapsed within you know, a year of starting your induction therapy, that's high risk regardless of what you were classified. So with that said, I think this patient by ISS, LDH, FISH showing not only 414, but the deletion 17P in a high percentage. I think that's another important topic, which is clonal burden and allele burden matters for 17P. Is it monoallelic or biallelic deletion? And how many cells have that uh, loss of 17P? These are all important concepts, but this patient would be high risk, um, I think, by whatever methodology, and hopefully we would uh, all agree to treat this person aggressively. But you still uh, kind of give this perspective of that these are probabilities. We know Correct. that our patients with 414 uh, having stage three in terms of burden. We know with all the new drugs, yeah. you have the new combinations. You can you can deplete the burden of disease even in a few cycles with the modern therapies. But maybe the 17p uh, deletion of one allele, if there is a mutation on the other allele, that could be the biallelic inactivation of P53. That would probably be a bad prognosis. But we don't know that based on data here. Yeah. It's just a probability. Yeah. So uh, I agree. Do you have any other way of communicating risk? No, I, I agree with everything Ajay said. I think uh, patients who want to know about prognosis, I think it's appropriate to tell them that you're worried that you may not be able to keep their disease under control as long as some other patients, but also emphasize that in 2019, we can make this patient feel better uh, and treat them and have every expectation that they'll respond to therapy. And then we, as, as you said, we all have these patients who have very bad prognostic features who nonetheless do better than we would expect. And we always want to hold out hope for that. You, I'm sure you have had Nina patients coming saying uh, five years later, do I still have high risk? The do doctor told me that the first time, but I, the disease has never really been bad. Right, so by definition, clinically, they don't have high risks if they've made it five years. But I do think that if you see a lot of myeloma patients, and a lot of times patients have been referred, even from their primary doctor or primary oncologist, and no one had the result of the fish, or, you know, now 2020 hindsight, it is our job to tell this patient about the risk. And the reason for that is they may never hear it um, if they don't hear it from us. So I, it's a hard conversation to have. Uh, but I would, on the, if I was sitting in that chair, I wouldn't want to have not been told this information. And I always want to give as much information as I can, but I agree with you, Ajay. It's really, really hard to process Kaplan-Meier curves and, and, and statistics in that first, you know, in that first appointment when they're just like deer in the headlights. It's really tough. So it's on us to communicate this effectively and repeatedly. I think, um, and clinical trials. I think this is, and Al and I like this population for upfront CAR T, for example, um, and we, we hope that clinical trials make use of this population or address this population. I should say. Uh, all these prognostic tests are not, they're not pregnancy tests. We're not determining pregnant, non-pregnant. It's like a little bit pregnant or a little bit less <laughs> yeah. pregnant. That's Which definitely what does not are. exist. It <laughs> not, really, not really work in uh, an OBGYN uh, situation. That would not really be a good test to have.